Hello, 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 and welcome to Joy in Our Town. We are so happy you joined us today. I'm Orlina Brazier, and we are here with a very special guest talking about substance abuse. Joining me is Richard Molina, who's the lead therapist at the Recovery Villages in Umatilla, Florida. Welcome. Thank you. We're Appreciate so happy to have you with us Thank you. to share of your expertise in this field of um, we're going to first talk about drug abuse and coping skills, but before we get to that, would you share with our audience a little bit about who you are and what brought you through to this place that you're in now? Well, sure. I, uh, like I said, I'm originally from New York, and I graduated from Florida State with my degree in psychology, and I went wow. to UCF for my master's, and after that, I centralized my expertise on substance abuse. I have unfortunately had some uh, family members that have suffered from substance abuse over the years, some of which who have passed away. Um, so I've chosen to kind of have my expertise to try to help others that are suffering from the same condition. Is that what kind of drove you to through this to this field, losing people that you loved? Yes. That is amazing. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're very busy. And you, Mattella, where is that? That's, you were uh, telling about, me? About uh, 15, 20 minutes north of Mount Dora. So oh. about an hour or so north of yeah, here. Yeah, so not too far away. <laughs> well, we're so happy you've joined us today. And, and I know that our audience, you are going to go get a pencil, paper, take down some notes because this gentleman really cares and really has a lot to share with us. So let's start with drug abuse. We're gonna be talking about drug abuse and the coping skills and some of the factors that contribute to it. So take, take it away. Well, to start off, substance abuse tends to be something that starts off at a relatively young age. Um, we have individuals on average, in my experience, starting at around 14 to 15 years old. So we're talking about teenagers that are starting with whether it be marijuana use or some minimal alcohol use and at the time not necessarily causing much problems in their lives. Uh, the issue becomes when they start to use it more regularly and they start to have more adult problems at 18, 24, 26, mm -hmm. having to pay bills and having to go to work, um, the problems start to add up. Uh, so they're using substances as a means of coping with life, whether it be stress, um, whether it be you know my boyfriend or girlfriend dumped me or once again in grade school I'm dealing with issues with my teachers um, and then they continue to use these same coping skills as adults when they have much more mature problems um, and these coping skills aren't helping them inevitably starting to lead to both physical social and even spiritual deteriorations in their life and also they can't hold jobs when they start getting into True. too many drugs Agreed. what are some of the main drug problems that you see out there which drugs right now i would say that the biggest two biggest offenders are uh, individuals that are addicted to opiates, which are come into classifications of either prescription drugs, so oxycotton or uh, hydrocodone or heroin, and wow. the second being alcohol. How do these people afford this kind of <laughs> drug habit? You know, I have yet to really figure that out, honestly. My patients have ranged from telling me that they'll spend $50 a day to hundreds of dollars a day, and I don't consciously understand how they can afford that, but I do know that they go out of their way to make sure that it happens. They will, whether it be manipulating family members, manipulating at work, whether it be pawning things, stealing, they've developed coping skills that are very maladaptive behaviors in general of society, but they support their substance use by doing these things. So what about the people that are using these drugs? What are you seeing out there is happening? Well, as far as the substance use is concerned, once again, they're using it as means of coping and they're realizing that as they get into coping. adults, they're unable to cope with life by using their substances. Like you said, they're unable to keep jobs, they're unable to stay steadily connected with their family members. Um, they tend to isolate after years of substance use. And these individuals, once again, they started, most of them, at a very young age, so it's been a pattern for them to continue to use these things. And in the beginning, it never caused any problems. But towards the end, when they're in their 20s and 30s and they're starting to realize that job is important, paying bills is important, being able to maintain social connections with their family is important, um, their substance use is getting in the way of that. 
So I know that you said you had some statistics for nationally yes. for drugs. What, what are those? Uh, well, one of the biggest and most alarming statistics at this point, uh, as some of your audience may know, is uh, prescription drugs, specifically opiates. Um, they were the leading cause in 2013 for injury-related deaths in this country, uh, averaging at around 44 to 45,000 nationwide. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of deaths for a country our size, but it was the leading cause in 2013 for injury-related deaths. Wow. Which that. specifically is poisoning, which is what we refer to as overdose. And you said prescription drugs. So prescription drugs are almost as, as prevalent as the other drugs, as people taking illegal drugs, correct? Yes, there is definitely a trend recently within the medical profession where prescription drugs are you know, prescribed for back pain or hip pain or some form of surgery, and these individuals not really knowing um, the danger of which take, taking these prescription drugs outside of how they're medically prescribed can create a tolerance for themselves, which in turn need their eventually what a tolerance means is you need more of the substance to get the same effect. So if your doctor prescribes you, let's say, 30 pills in a month and you're supposed to take one a day, mm. um, if you start to take that outside of that, uh, a prescribed regimen and start taking one and a half a day or two a day because your tolerance is going up, it starts to lead down a very scary path. A slippery slope, huh? And then here they are with all of this medication in them and they have to have more and more and more. And do you see that doctors, they go to different doctors and they prescribe pills? This was an epidemic where we had what we refer to in the field as doctor shopping. So mm -hmm. individuals will go from one doctor to another with cash um, and just at a lot of the pain management clinics. This has started to be re uh, starting to get resolved in this state at least. Um, we've, uh, this state, the government has put into certain uh, requirements to kind of prevent this from occurring. But over the past, I'd say five to ten years up until this point, it has definitely been an issue. So coping skills, how can people cope with their drug problems that are watching, that really, really have a family member that they love, that they want to get off of drugs, or that they want to encourage to get off drugs. And maybe somebody's watching that has a drug problem and they're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is overtaking me and I want to stop. What can they do? I think the biggest thing that anyone can do if they either are suffering from substance abuse or have a family member who is, is seek professional assistance. Um, there are facilities both on an outpatient and inpatient basis throughout this country, plenty in even the central Florida area to help assist with that. Um, and the reason I say this is because depending on what substance it is that they're abusing, um, there could very well be a, me a lot of medical complications with detoxing them off of those substances. So for instance, um, with uh, individuals who suffer from opiate dependence, there are a lot of withdrawal symptoms that resemble flu-like symptoms, um, very mm. severe flu-like symptoms. So there needs to be medical monitoring for these individuals when we're, getting, when we're taking them off of the drugs. So when they're coming off, they get sick because mm -hmm. their body, probably the toxins, are like going crazy from the drugs. and it. it because doesn't drugs, how long does drugs stay in your system? Well, it kind of depends on the substance. So for oh, instance, um, with, indiv with substances like heroin or cocaine, it's a much shorter half-life. So individuals, if they stop using today, within three, four days, it would be out of their system. Mm -hmm. um, but, in, but substances like marijuana that are fat soluble, depending on how often they're using, it could stay in their system for a month plus. Well, marijuana too is legal in a lot of states now. Sure. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> it definitely but, adds concerns for us in the field. Yes. So um, to have, what exactly, can you give an, um, maybe an example of someone that, you know, used a coping skill that, that you've, you know, required and how it's changed their life? Well, some of the coping skills that we teach at our facility um, and some of the ones that are just taught in the field generally, um, one of the big ones is something as simple as deep breathing. Um, so individuals tend to not really notice how important it is to control one's breathing and in, in, in effect to kind of help them with their anxiety or kind of help them with uh, just stress management in general. Uh, journaling also is another important one. Um, journaling. Journal, wow. just being able to get your thoughts out. A lot of individuals that suffer from substance abuse and just the general population like the idea of being heard and want to know that their thoughts and their feelings are important. So sometimes being able to journal that and have that on paper so that's something that you can read and something you can get out is it, it has this certain sense of relief for their emotions. 
That is great. And you know, I have heard about breathing techniques. Tell it, explain exactly how you would do that for someone that's watching, like breathing, what do you mean? So, so sure. the reason breathing is so important is because our heart, for instance, is, a very, is an automatic muscle. We really don't want that muscle to stop working. It just beeps <laughs> for as long as we're thankfully alive. But our lungs, on the other hand, are not. So our lungs, um, we can hold our breath. So even though it kind of seems like our lungs are working automatically, we're in control of them. So if, with deep breathing, what we can do is we try to fill our lungs as much as we can. And one of the instances that you can tell that you're doing it correctly is if you feel your stomach kind of extend outward, that's how you know that your lungs are full. Because most people tend to breathe up here, kind of shallow, yes. but one's lungs are pretty long. They fill your entire rib cage and most individuals aren't really fully aware of that. But by practicing deep breathing, one can reduce their stress, can better focus in, in any given moment uh, and allow for more critical thinking uh, if there's in, in times of stress. That is great, and that is a very good thing to do. I know that I've heard about that a lot, and it does help. I've tried to do that myself, <laughs> fighting asthma things. But what are some of the steps that a family and individual can do um, to that may have a drug abuse problem? And that'll be our final question on this topic. What I can say is, is if you have a family member that you're concerned about if you have any sort of suspect, uh, suspicions that they may be abusing substances or something's going on, I would seek help. Uh, go online and start to look for some of the national phone numbers that are around for organizations that can help find you um, information about how to identify some more of the uh, kind of factors that attribute to substance use. And if those factors are present, then talking with your loved one about whether or not they're open to entering into a program to kind of help them get off. Because if they're not really willing, then they're probably not going to get help, right? There is, thankfully, some laws in this state specifically. I'm not sure if how many other states abide by them, but there is a state law in Florida called the Marchman Act. And there, your audience can kind of research and get specifics into what that looks like. But there are ways to what we refer to as involuntarily place someone into treatment if, because of substance use, they are a danger to their own life. Well, that's something. Well, we really thank you for coming and representing, um, being that you're the lead therapist at the Recovery Village here in Florida. And, and we thank you for your expert opinion on this. And right now, we're going to run to a 30-second PSA, and we'll be right back. Life is made of moments. Family. A drunk driver could take it all away. Keep your family safe on the road, because after all, nothing is more beautiful. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Keep your family safe. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. If you've just joined us, we are here with Richard Molina, who's the lead therapist at the Recovery Village in Umatilla, Florida. And we are so happy that you have joined us. We're gonna be talking now about the family disease of alcoholism. And this is a very important subject because, I mean, even in the newspapers everywhere, alcohol is so abused today. Yes. So tell us a little bit about alcoholism and why, why you refer to it as a family disease or why it is referred to as a family disease. Well, just like with any other action anyone takes, there's an effect that it has on those around them. And alcoholism has a great deal of effect, whether it be uh, emotional or physical or even verbal abuse that can occur from someone who is suffering from alcoholism and is in a place to not be able to deal with their own emotions and is unsure how to deal with those around them. So whether it be a father or a mother or a sister or a brother, it greatly affects everyone that's around them, whether it be employees, uh, co-workers, or even you know friends of the family. It seems like all substance abuse, no matter what it is, is it really can just crush everything in your life. It just can destroy everything. Agreed. So, so tell us, I know that there's some statistics and those are kind of important. And you said that you do have statewide statistics yes, on within, alcoholism. Yes, within the state of Florida, the most recent statistics that I found is that about 3% of the population wow. suffers from some form of alcoholism. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but based off of the population that we have in this state, which is about 19 million, if I'm not mistaken, that's about half a million people. Um, so that's half a million family members, half a million uh, 
children, half a million individuals that could be possibly connected to this and these individuals that are also suffering with the process of substance use. And we're talking about all ages, from very young children, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what is the age you think that they're starting? Well, with alcohol, most individuals that I've found at this point in my, in my experience working in the field, there tends to be around between the ages of 13 to 14 is when they start to first drink. Um, now, these individuals at that time aren't necessarily experiencing a lot of the negative consequences that come from alcoholism, but they have the foots, the, you know, the stepping stones to kind of lead to that once they get into adulthood. Yeah, they like doing it like for partying and filling whatever they feel. I don't know, what does alcohol make people feel like? Just that well, numb and they don't, mm -hmm. they just can play, they just aren't themselves, correct? True. There tends to be kind of like a social lubricant when they're young, um, yes. I imagine. I mean, from, I remember when I was a teenager, you know, very social kind of situations can mm -hmm. feel very awkward, whether you're talking with a girl or a boy, and it kind of feels just difficult to kind of be yourself. Um, alcohol can definitely give people the impression that they are more themselves, mm -hmm. when in reality, um, what these children are doing and what the adults, uh, as they grow older, are doing, are just numbing a lot of their emotions. Mm -hmm. So they're coping with that anxiety by kind of trying to push it away, so it feels as if they don't have it, um, but then the the flip side of the consequences of that are, you know, whether it be unable to stay at work, unable mm. to function emotionally as an adult, unable to keep a family. Um, if it becomes a dependence issue as an adult, it, it has many consequences for many people. Isn't there a disease of alcoholism too, where some people are almost, they act like allergic to it and it causes them to not be together? I mean, what, what is that? Well, the disease of addiction, as far as uh, the mental health field is concerned, is one that's, we basically see it as, this is something that is chronic condition for these individuals. So it's not something that is ever going to go away in the sense that if they stop using their substances now and remain clean and sober, if they were to ever relapse and start using substances again, the effects on the brain would return and will return rather oh. quickly. Um, so the effects is, that you were talking about as far as like the allergic and kind of um, almost sickness feeling tends to come from individuals when they're withdrawing off of substances. Um, something that's very important for everyone in your audience to understand is that alcohol specifically is one of the few substances that one can die from detoxing from. Wow, and so, they do. So if, if there is anyone out there that is suffering from substance abuse and has alcohol as their substance of choice, there's definitely a, a dire need for them to be under medical supervision if they're going to be detoxing off of it. That's why it's so important to get help, even coming off of any kind of drug. They just say, you know, I know some drugs are supposed to come off slowly. Yes, and, and so, alcohol is one of them. And, oh, it is. Alcohol okay. is definitely a substance that, um, for instance, depend. obviously it depends on the, the rate of substance use that this person, so if they're drinking, you know, four or five beers a day versus some of my patients have drank up to a bottle a day of liquor. Um, based off of that, our medical staff at our facility and at most facilities are judging how long it's going to take and with what medications are going to be needed to help safely detox patients off of substances because one of the possible consequences of not doing that is a seizure. And oh. a seizure is... Um, can happen at any point in time. It can be very dangerous. My goodness, you wouldn't even think of that. But that makes sense, you know, because it's, it is a drug. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is considered a drug, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my goodness. So um, what would parents, uh, the genes, I wanted to talk about genes. What is it like if a parent's been an alcoholic, mm -hmm. does it roll over into the children that want to be that? Or is there something in them that drives them to drink? <laughs> I can definitely say that there is a genetic component and there I would is. say that the research at this point hasn't yet dis, uh, come to determine the full effect of those genetic components and whether or not it skips a generation and so on and so forth. But what I can say is that if there's a loved one that consciously knows that their father or mother or grandfather clearly drank too much, um, the best way of being able to solve this is just to have an honest right. conversation. You know, talk with your loved ones about what it is that you experienced growing up or what it was that you experienced if you yourself had a substance abuse issue and be honest with your loved ones. Obviously age appropriately, um, especially if you have a teenager that's 14 or 15 years old. At this point, 
they probably need to know the dangers that come along with experimenting with substances of any kind, whether they be alcohol or drugs. How do you recommend a family member talking to their youth about it? Well, one thing that I would definitely recommend is if there's somebody that you are concerned about, uh, whether it be, especially a young adult, you know, from 15 to like 16 or 17 years old, there is, I would recommend seeking out assistance with how to kind of communicate this information. There are plenty of therapists that can help kind of guide that conversation in a bit of a more of a neutral standing. Because sometimes, I, at least I remember when I was a kid, <laughs> there was, it's very difficult for my parents to be able to tell me anything because they're my parents. So right. it's, 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 there Kids is that kind of connection. Kids don't want to listen to their parents. <laughs> yes, and I have been guilty of that for, for, my, for my share of things. But because of that, <laughs> but because of that, there might be needing for like a central kind of person that is separate from being the parent that can kind of deliver a lot of this information and kind of connect the dots for them in a more objective way without having that emotional connection. I wish that schools would have more talks about this. Are you seeing that opening up at all, or do you go into like schools and actually talk to the youth? I have not had the opportunity to get to do that just yet. I would like to. Um, I do know that within the Central Florida area, there are organizations that do that. There are counseling organizations, oh, nonprofit agencies that work in the uh, in the school agency. I don't really know what specifically they're doing there, but I do know that their goal is to try to educate as much as possible on the possible consequences of substance use. Because we, we, at this point, we want the children to be as educated as possible so that they understand that what they're getting themselves into could very well be a very dangerous path. That is so good. And I really appreciate, Richard, all that you do to, to help this and working with this recovery village. And I tell you, there's so many problems I know with alcoholism. I read it in the paper every day and we hear it on the news. And two, I, it probably um, is some of the reason why there's so many shootings around. <laughs> You know, substance abuse, obviously, if you were to consider, like, the, the obviously, alcohol is a legal substance, but um, it does, there is a great deal of violent and just accidental things that occur when someone's inebriated. And if they're drinking enough alcohol, whether it be behind, behind the wheel or uh, if they're upset, I believe that there was a, there's information out that states that you know, any sort of abuse in the home tends to increase significantly if there's alcohol present there. So if there's someone that's drinking alcohol heavily, there tends to be even more abuse, whether it be domestic violence or uh, child abuse in some form, that, that, that increases much more if there's someone present in the home that is suffering from alcoholism. And another very serious issue is DUIs, people True. drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. And I know the statistics on that is awful. Has it come down at all, do you know, in this state? In this state, I, f to be honest, I don't know specifically if it's gone down, but the last I read over the last few years, it's been kind of steady. Um, wow. It, it's, it is still very much an issue. But it's, it, there's such a, you have to pay so much for that, and it just ruins your record and your insurance and, and all of that, but people just still do it. <laughs> the amount that it affects society as a whole is very high. Obviously, the amount that you're paying as far as a ticket or, or court fees, but also with jail whatever time. property damage, jail time, uh, not being able to go to work, your employer having to find a new person to work for them if, if you're unable to go to work because you can't drive anymore. You know, the, the, the amount of money that it goes as far as statistically for nationwide is in the billions, the amount alcohol cost the country. When you start to consider the legal and the private sector employment, um, what they end up having to do to compensate for individuals. And when you drink, isn't just one drink or does it, de it depends on body weight, right? That, that you, people should be very careful not to go over. Um, what, what, at this point, the way your body tends to process alcohol is about one drink per hour. It takes about an hour to be able to process through it. So anything over that, you are starting to look into dangerous territory. Obviously, depending on body weight, um, uh, but also one, another thing to consider is just like with drugs, alcohol, you gain a certain tolerance to it. So one beer, the first time you take it may make you feel a little bit of a buzz, but after years of drinking beers, after years of starting to drink alcohol, that same buzz isn't until after four or five beers. Mm. So your body starts to get used to it.
that that's what's dangerous, huh? Because you yeah. just start getting used to it. It's like anything. The more you you know, you need more and more and more, and then you get you lose it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what are some of the steps that families can take to help their loved one to get out of alcoholism or to even fess up that they have an issue? Well, you know, I and think we'll that, end on this one. <laughs> no, thank you. I think one one the most important things to do is obviously is to talk to your loved ones and be honest with them about what it is that you're experiencing when they're using substances and encourage them to seek out professional assistance. Um, these individuals, it is once again, specifically with alcohol, it is not safe for them to detox on their own. Certain people might think that, all right, you know, if, I, if, if I'm drinking a bottle a day, if I just wean myself off and drink a little bit of the bottle throughout the day, I can get myself off of it. And it's a very mm. dangerous thought. Um, so we want to make sure that family members are seeking professional help, whether it be in an inpatient or an outpatient basis. And there are plenty of websites and phone numbers that they can reach out to over the internet to kind of seek out that professional help. In their area. That in, they can, yes. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, where you're at might be too far, mm -hmm. but there's so many places out there. Yes. And people need to get in a program and even family members need to get help because they accept it by not dealing with it, correct? They end up becoming a part of the cycle because they themselves are trying to cope with their loved one's substance use and because they love their loved one and because they want them to live and survive, they end up becoming a part of the process and until they understand wow. what behaviors they're doing that are making it difficult for their loved one to make changes in their lives, they're going to continue to do these things unintentionally. That is so sad, but I tell you, this has been awesome, Richard. I thank you so much for your expertise in this area and all that you've gone through. And we want to thank you, Richard, again, for coming and being a part and sharing with us today all of these things that I know will help you. So thank you for joining us, and we want you to go and have a wonderful day. Be blessed, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California.